All right, so now we're going to look at a little bit of uh, interesting things about how to manipulate statistics or how people manipulate statistics. Now, I say this because, again, I want you to be a little bit skeptical about the results that you see. You should always ask sort of why somebody is sharing the statistics that they have, what are those types of statistics. You know, where did they come from? Um, because a lot of times statistics can be misused. And we've all had, we've all seen examples of where statistics is misused on accident and where statistics is misused on purpose. All right, we can go through those, um, well, a lot of those. Okay, now I want to say something before I, I get into this. When I say be skeptical, all right, I'm not saying distrust everything. I'm not saying throw out every single number you've ever seen, okay? All I'm saying is think a little bit about where those things came from, whether the person sharing those with you has some sort of agenda or what that person's agenda is, okay, when you see results. So what we're going to do is look first is we're going to look at ways in which sort of the design of the study can be bad. All right. And the first thing that pops up in most people's mind when they when they see results is a lot of times they they criticize the sample. So when a sample is not representative of the population, we have something called suspect samples. Suspect samples. All right. So, for instance, we saw earlier that one technique of sampling is a convenient sample. And we had internet polls. Those are always tend to give you suspect samples that you get samples that are not um, truly indicative of the actual population you're looking at. I saw the other, or just today, um, as I was making, before I was making this video, some sort of internet poll about how to make a website better. Well, who's going to answer those polls? Probably one of two groups. People who really like the website and are on there a lot, or people who really have an axe to grind with whatever organization it is. All right, so internet polls tend to give you suspect samples, and that's why they're bad. But there's a lot of other ways to get suspect samples. All right, it turns out if you go outside of a polling booth and you just let people come up to you and say, and say, well, we want to, uh, oh, what do I want to say? We want to pull people, and we're going to give away free t-shirts. Well, if you give away free t-shirts, then the types of people who are, you're getting to pull are not probably indicative of the actual, um, and not representative of the actual population you may be going for. All right, so suspect samples just means you don't get a good sample. Now, I said suspect samples is probably the first thing that comes to mind, but probably the first thing that you should try when you're talking about criticizing a study, all right, is to look for lurking variables, lurking variables, all right, because oftentimes studies leave out variables. So let's take an example I... I use a lot. If you look at smoking and crime rates, you'll see that there, there's probably a little bit link. People who, let me say this way, people who smoke as a group, a higher percentage of those people commit crimes than people who don't smoke. All right? Now, if you just look at a study of smoking and crime, 
think about all the variables you left out, like, you know, economic status or social status, right? Where you grew up and, and what you've done. And it turns out if you look at, you know, economics and social status, you know, the, the, this has an influence on both smoking and crime rates. So if you just look at an example where you just have smoking and crime rates, then you've probably left out some other variables that, uh, that you probably want to look for. And this is probably the first thing that you should look for when you see a study. When you see this weird uh, a correlation of two variables, think about, well, what other variables could have affected this? What are other variables are linked? And oftentimes, you don't get a nice pretty picture. There's so many things that are linked and interlinked that, uh, especially in human beings, that, uh, that can throw you off. Now the last uh, slide here is question bias. Now what I mean by question bias, well I mean a, a couple of things. First off, you could ask the question, if, you're, if we're, we're doing polls, let's pretend we're doing polls here. And my study, I'm polling people on their opinions. Well, the way in which I ask the question can bias the outcome, all right? For instance, let's pretend I'm doing a poll, and I want to talk about uh, increasing or decreasing tax rates. Let's, let's assume I want, I want that. Well, if I ask the same sort of question, if I ask a question like, um, should the rich let me do it let me write this down should rich people pay higher taxes all right so, if I ask the question like this, should rich people pay higher taxes, okay? It turns out that what you're going to get is you're going to get more people say, yes, rich people should pay higher taxes. If I change that question slightly, and I say, I say should, or let me write it this way, let me what should the highest percentage of taxes be? You could. So, what should the highest percentage of taxes be? It turns out if you ask these two questions, most people will say yes to this one. And then if you ask them actually what the highest percentage of taxes should be, it comes out, it averages out to about 25%. Now there's a problem with this. The problem is 25% is actually much less than the current rate of taxes. So I've asked a very similar question in two different ways. And I've really gotten two different answers. If I ask the question in this way, well, rich people would have to pay more in taxes. If I ask the question in this way, what's the highest percent? Well, 25% would be actually a big tax cut for the rich people. All right? So be aware that the way in which you ask a question can influence the outcome. And then there's other question bias as well. Um, there's subtle ways in which ordering of the question can, or of the questions that you ask, can give you a different result. And even things like the appearance of the questioner can give you a different result. Sort of the, the blunt way to do this is if I went to uh, 
people's house and ask them about legalizing marijuana. And I was dressed as a police officer. You might get slightly different results than if I went to the same people's house dressed as um, a college student with, I don't know, uh, a crazy backpack on that has, you know, the the marijuana leaf on it or, you know, a picture of the marijuana leaf on it or something like this, all right? You get different results. Now, I'm not saying, again, it's going to be 100 versus 0 either way. What I'm saying is that it might be 60 versus 40 one way, and then if I went dressed as another way, it might be, I don't know, 45 versus 55, something slightly different, okay? So lots of ways, uh, there's lots of ways that you have to be cognizant if you're design, designing a question, a poll of any sort, you have to be cognizant of how you ask the question, what the order of the question is, how you look when you do this, and, and things of that nature. And by the way, just another note on appearance, there are certain people out there that if you look a certain way, if you're not... Uh, if you're not dressed up or if you're not uh, looking a certain way, who aren't really going to actually respond to your poll. All right. So the way in which you dress, the way in which you conduct yourself does actually oftentimes um, get, you, get you better response rates.